All right, if you have a Bible, open up anywhere. It's all good. I have no specific place to go to this morning. Uh, I've been thinking, and uh, we're traveling back from Connecticut uh, yesterday. And uh, throughout the travel, I was trying to contemplate on how to to approach this message, where to start and, and uh, how to, to get it going and so forth and how to proceed through it. And most of the time in my messages, I try to you know, have a logical approach to the message. In other words, I begin at one uh, place and I build on that and, and just progress on to a conclusion. Uh, this message is really... There's a conclusion to this, but it's a little bit different. I mean, normally it's like, if you will, if you could picture a staircase. You start at the bottom of the staircase and each step builds upon the other until you get to the end. This message is not like that. This message, if you can imagine or picture a parachute. A parachute has cords that are attached to the outside of the parachute, but they all seem to funnel down into one place. And that's what this message is going to be like. Now, the reason why I say that is because there is the, the chance or the possibility of me losing you, and, and you're going to sit there, well, what is he talking about? Why is he, you know, and he, he's jumping here and he's jumping there and so forth. I just want you to understand that all of it works together to come to a conclusion that's just coming from different directions. So hopefully, by the grace of God, uh, you'll be able to follow and get the common point here Uh, of the message, and uh, Lord willing, I won't lose you in this. So before we start, let's go ahead and open up with a word of prayer. Father, we know that you're you're good. You're good all the time. And Lord, even when we as individuals or as church face difficulties of one sort or another, you're always good, and there's, uh, there's no trickery with you. Sometimes you test us. Sometimes you try us to see if we're going to do right in spite of the allurement of the world or what the devil places before us or change or anything else that comes along that may tempt us to do something outside of the character that you've uh, established from your word that we should follow. So Lord, I pray that you give wisdom and and great uh, grace uh, to us as individuals and us as a church as we face some of these trials that come our way. Uh, Lord, we know that you can guide us through, and we know that you can carry us through. And uh, so, Lord, uh, we are looking to you. All of those verses that we've memorized and trusting thee, Lord, I pray that all of those would come flooding back to our memories. Lord God, that we could trust in you uh, to bring us through whatever trials we're going through. Uh, Father, we ask your blessing upon the ministry Uh, We ask uh, your blessing upon this service. We ask your blessing upon your word. We ask your blessing upon this message, Lord, that it might be to your honor and to your glory. Lord, that you'd help me in a cogent way to be able to, to declare your word and the message that you've laid on my heart that people might understand and know what's being said and be able to apply it to their lives that they might be what they are supposed to be in your sight from the Word of God. So Lord, I know the devil will try to uh, work to interfere, and I pray that you'd not give him space, not give him room. I pray, I plead the blood of Jesus Christ over this building. Lord, all of the devices that we have, Lord, that nothing would go awry. Lord God, that your saints might hear the preaching of your Word for the glory of God. Lord, again, we pray for those that uh, are off in distant lands and even those here domestically, Lord, that are serving our country and protecting our freedoms. We ask, Lord, for their safety, for their protection. And most of all, we ask, Lord, that they might hear the gospel, that they might be saved. Lord God, that their eternity would be set. Lord, that they'd not have to face the fires of hell. Lord God, we ask, Lord, for your guidance, your wisdom, your spirit to work and move in hearts and lives. Lord, we ask that you would please work in our community here in South Buffalo, Lord, that you would uh, reach souls for Jesus Christ through our efforts, Lord, that we'd be faithful in serving you. And Lord, uh, all of these things, God, we just want to give you thanks and praise because you are good and you're good all the time. 
We ask this in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Now I'm going to give you a, a list, or I'm going to read off a, a list of, of verses. And all of these will have some bearing upon what we're going to be talking about here this morning. I'll give you the reference if you want to write down the reference and look these up at your leisure, but to turn to each one in rapid fire would be difficult for most of you, so uh, I'm just going to read them off. In 1 John chapter 1 and verse 5, it says, This then is the message which we have heard of him, and declare unto you that God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. The Gospel of John Chapter 1, verses 4 and 5, it says, In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. In 1 Peter chapter 2, and verse 9, it says this, But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 14. Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness, and what communion hath light with darkness? In the Gospel of John, again, in chapter 8, verse 12, Then uh, then spake Jesus again unto them, saying, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have light, uh, shall have the light of life. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 3 and 4. But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. The Gospel of John again, chapter 9, verse 5. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. One last scripture. Matthew chapter 5, verses 14 and 15. Ye are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick, and it giveth light to all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they which see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Now, of the cords of the parachute, let me start with this one. God is light. The essence of God is pure light. In the Bible, your, the, the, the word or light, if you will, is connected with pureness or with that which is right. God is connected with that which is evil or wicked or impure. That's what darkness is connected with. Therefore, we have the contrast between light and darkness. They are opposites of each other. That is why when we're talking about Christians walking in the Lord, he gives contrasts or opposites. We read one verse of this passage, but let me read the whole thing so that you can understand that there are opposites or contrasts within this that the Lord speaks to Christians about. In that 2 Corinthians chapter 6, it says, be not Uh, Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers, for what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion hath light with darkness? And what concord or agreement hath Christ with Belial or the devil? What part hath he that believeth with an infidel or an unbeliever? And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? They don't, they're opposite. 
For ye are the temple of the living God, as God has said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Therefore come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord. Touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. There are opposites, light and darkness. They're not the same. I want you to think about this, and this sometimes, you know, we, we, we just pass over this and we just consider it as just, I don't know if it's just, we don't realize the, the essence of it, if you will, and I'm not trying to be super highfalutin and all that, but with the word essence, it seems to be one of those scholarly words, and I'm not really a scholar, so don't, uh, don't confuse me with them. But darkness is the absence of light. Darkness is the absence of light. We see this each and every day, as the scripture tells us in Psalm 19. The Bible says, The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth, forth, showeth His handiwork. We see it every day. When the sun is setting and going beyond the horizon and things, the light leaves our sight, darkness follows behind it. Darkness cannot be where light is. So when the sun goes down, darkness takes over. When the sun rises, the darkness flees and light shines forth. Darkness is the absence of of light. This created light that we have, we just talked about, the sun, uh, is a picture of God Himself. That's why the heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament show us His handiwork. We see that God is and uh, the dark like the devil. And so forth, and in, they make that equation or that 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 uh, uh, correlation throughout the scripture, which we'll see here in a little bit. But that sun that we see out there is a dim bulb compared to the essence of light that God is. In fact, when God speaks of Jesus Christ in the scriptures, He refers to Him as the sun. Take your Bible, if you will, and find Matthew, and then turn one book back to the book Malachi. Malachi chapter 4, it's the last book in the Old Testament. And this is a prophecy regarding Jesus Christ. And no one would be in lower case unless it's starting the sentence, obviously, then it would be the first, uh, you know, capitalized then. But he capitalizes it here because he's making a reference to Jesus Christ. In Malachi chapter 4 and verse 2, But unto you that fear my name shall the Son of righteousness arise with healing in his wings, and he shall go forth and grow up as calves of the stall. So it's letting you know there that believe it or not, that Jesus Christ is going to come into this earth. God is going to become flesh. He's going to grow up as a young child and grow up into a man. And he's going to come with healing in his wings. He is the son of righteousness. That is why he commanded no one to look upon him. Do you realize that if you look at the sun, you damage your eyes? Uh, if you weren't told by your parents, they should have told you, not to look directly at the sun. Because prolonged look at the sun and look at that thing and stare at it, you'll either blind yourself or you'll seriously damage your retina and so forth, all the, the process of your eye. And you'll not be able to uh, see. And when God is speaking of himself as the light of the world, He's telling us that He is so pure and He is so holy that we cannot look upon Him. If we can't look upon the Son which He created, we cannot look upon His glory. 
That's why he told Moses, when Moses said, God, I want to see your glory. And of course, Moses had proved himself enough that God says, all right, um, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'm going to put you in the cleft of the rock and I'm going to take my hand and I'm going to hide you from my front parts. But I'll let you, as I pass by, I'm going to open it up a little bit and you'll get to see my hinder parts. And from that point on, if you, don't, if you have not read your Old Testament or maybe you just read it so casually, the next time Moses shows up, you know what he has to do? He has to put a veil in front of his face. Because his face shone so like a light beaming or radiating from his face. And he had to put a veil over his face because he had seen the hinder parts of God and his glory. God, throughout the scripture, hides himself from his creation. If you were to take a look through the scriptures, there are too many places to, to, to declare but God says He forms a thick cloud and He hides His presence in the third heaven from the rest of creation. That's why it's dark out there. He hides it from His creation so that he, the, the creation cannot see the light of His presence. He hides it with thick clouds. Whenever He would make an appearance on earth, you know what He would do? He would come down with clouds so that the glory of God would not shine on all of those that were present. When He decided to make His presence known in the tabernacle and in the temple, you know what He did? He covered Himself with a thick curtain, a veil, so that His glory would not be seen. When all is said and done, when God finishes and time is no more and uh, the, this, this earth and this heaven that we see right now are, are blown away, melt with a fervent heat as it says in 2 Peter chapter 3 and He creates a new heaven and a new earth, He says, uh, you're, you're not going to need the sun anymore. You're not going to need the sun. In Revelation chapter talking about New Jerusalem which is the abode of us the bride of Christ, the Christians he says in the city hath no need of the sun neither of the moon to shine in it for the glory of God did lighten it and the lamb is the light thereof it goes on in Revelation chapter 22 and verse 5 and says and there shall be no night there and so there's no darkness and there and there neither light of the sun for the Lord God giveth them light and they shall reign forever and ever there are no shadows cast in that heaven that's amazing you would think that if there's a light shining if there's something here there is a shadow cast if a building is standing between the sun and and, uh, and the ground on the other side of the building, there is a shadow cast, which we'll come back to later on. There's no shadows cast in glory. God is light. He is the essence of light. It is not that it emanates from a single space, but God is light. And in Him is no darkness at all. Because of our resurrected bodies, we will be able to withstand the light and the glory of God. We will not have to shade or hide our eyes or God cover us with His hand. That With those resurrected bodies, we will be able to look upon God and see Him as He is. What a marvelous thing. We get carried about and worried about all the things of this life and it, all, it is all just temporary. What is going to last for all of eternity is being in the presence of God and His glory forever and ever and ever and ever. But if I, aside from the physical aspect of God as light, He also speaks of His, this light speaks of His purity and His holiness. This then is the message which we have heard of Him 
and declare unto you that God is light and in Him is no darkness at all. Take your Bible, go to that reference there. I want you to see what the context of that is about and show you that it's not so much the light of His presence or, or so forth, but it is talking in reference to His purity, to His holiness. 1 John chapter 1. Let's just take a moment here and read this portion and get the context. It's talking about Jesus Christ, that which was from the beginning, verse 1, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled of the Word, capital W, that's a reference to Jesus Christ, the Word of life. For the life was manifested or made clear or revealed, and we have seen it, seen it and bear witness and show unto you that eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested unto us. That which we have seen and heard declare we unto you, that ye also may have fellowship with us. And truly our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. And these things write we unto you, that your joy may be full. This then is the message which we have heard of Him, and declare unto you that God is light, and in Him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with Him, and walk in darkness, we lie, and do not the truth. But if we walk in the light, as He is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanseth us from all sin. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins, and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make Him a liar, and His word is not in us. You see, this reference to the fact that God is light is talking about His purity. It's talking about His... There is no sinfulness or wickedness in God. God dispels darkness and wickedness from Himself. Nothing wicked or unclean can be in His presence. Isaiah chapter 5 and verse 20, it says, Woe unto them that call evil good and good evil, and put darkness for light and light for darkness, that put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Do you realize that, that there are people that are trying to make good and evil the same thing? They're using situation ethics so that it is it, if they can come up with some quote, logical reason why to do something wrong that it justifies wrong. That is why they always use rape and incest as a justification for abortion. Because they're looking for some leeway, some room, some wiggle room in there to say that abortion is okay. It is killing a life. It is killing a life. But they're trying to call evil good. And with God, there is no mixing of the two. God is light, and in Him is no darkness at all. Let me grab another cord here of that parachute. So when Jesus shows up and begins to minister among the Jews, He declares that He is the light of the world. In uh, the first chapter, we read this at the beginning, the first uh, chapter of John, when John begins to reveal Jesus Christ as deity to uh, the, the, the world, if you will, as he wrote his gospel, he said, in him is, was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. So Jesus Christ, being the light, came to this world, came into a dark world, and this dark world did not understand him did not comprehend what Jesus Christ was doing. This world system is the darkness. 
And that's what we're seeing even to this day today. We read a couple of these verses and I want to rehearse them again in your mind so that you get the context of what we're talking about. Then spake Jesus again unto them saying, I am the light of the world and he that followeth me shall not walk in darkness but shall have the light of life. You see, when you come to Jesus Christ and you settle your account with Him, you're no longer to walk in the darkness of this world. You become light just like He is light. We're to walk in the light. Jesus Christ said in John chapter 9 and verse 5, As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Several places throughout the scripture and Jesus Christ used several different means by which to try to explain to his disciples what he's trying to get across. He, like I say many times, he used simple things to illustrate spiritual truths. He does this in John chapter 11, just prior or within the context of Lazarus being dead and then raised again. In verse 9 and 10 of John chapter 11, Jesus answered, Are there not twelve hours in the day? If any man walk in the day, he stumbleth not, because he seeth the light of this world. So in other words, as we're walking around in this world in the daytime, we can see where we're going, we see what's going on, and we're not likely to stumble. Now, unless you're me and trip over, you know, cracks in the sidewalk or whatever. But normally, as, the, as a, a rule is, if there is light out, we can see where we're going. But he goes on to say in verse 12, But if a man walk in the night, he stumbleth, because there is no light in him. Now, he changes that just a bit. Because what he does is he draws the spiritual connection to that. So the opposite of what he just said in the first verse is if there's light out, you can see where you're going, you're not going to stumble. But when it's dark out and we don't have the lantern, we don't have flashlights or anything else, street lights or whatever, when it's dark out, we can't see where we're walking and we're going to stumble. But he makes the spiritual connection. Instead of saying there's no light with you, he says there's no light in you. And of course, that light being in you is Jesus Christ. That's talking about salvation. That's talking about having a relationship and a fellowship with Him. You know this, and you understand this. The devil has put men in darkness. And he's made it comfortable. He's made this darkness comfortable for them to remain in. We read this verse before, it says, But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost. So the lost don't understand the gospel. In whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not. Now let me just stop there. If someone is blinded, they are in darkness. They cannot see. That is a spiritual darkness that he is talking about. He's talking about a blindness that comes upon them spiritually. So let me read that again. In whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. For we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves your servants for Jesus' sake, for God hath uh, God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness has shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. He has told each and every one of us that face a blinded world, a world that is in darkness, to give them light. The light of the gospel. We're to preach Christ Jesus and Him crucified. He is the light of the world. But the men of today, just like the men of Jesus Christ's day, reject the light. They reject the light. 
just to repeat some verses again in, found in John chapter 3. For God sent not His Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through Him might be saved. He that believeth on Him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already. Why? Because he hath not believed on the name of the only begotten Son of God. Notice he did not believe on the name of the only begotten Son of God. It's not having Jesus into your life. You have to believe upon the name of Jesus Christ. Believing who He is and what He did for you. Going on, verse 19. And this is the condemnation. This is the reason why men uh, are in darkness. This is the condemnation that light is come into the world and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. For everyone that doeth evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. When you expose, or when God exposes light to this blinded world in darkness, it's an offense to them. They can't stand it. It upsets them. It is unpleasant to them. If any of you have tried to witness to family or loved ones or even strangers, you're going to find out that as soon as you try to bring this up, they, are un they do not like what is being said to them. They love darkness rather than light. The devil has caused them to think that the darkness, their sleeping in darkness, is better than having the light of God revealed to them. It is like someone who has been placed in a dungeon. They've been in this dungeon for months at a time. Not a ray of sunshine or a ray of any kind of light has entered in. They're in utter darkness. But they bring them out of that dungeon and bring them out into the light. And you know what happens? They can't open their eyes. They, they shy away from the light. The light is unpleasant to them. It hurts their eyes. And that's exactly what is happening when you give the gospel to someone who is lost in darkness. They can't bear the light. It is an offense to them. It's shocking to them. It's, I can't take this. Take it away. Take it away. That is the reaction that you receive when someone wants or does not want to see the light of the glory of God. It is a shock to them. They have been pacified with religion. They have been pacified with the lusts of this world, and they're complacent, and they're, they're in darkness. The devil has blinded their mind that they should believe not. Another chord of that parachute is this, that the reality of that light is the best thing that it could ever take place to them. Someone who is in blindness and darkness of their own sin, when that light is revealed, if they embrace that light, it is the best thing that ever could happen to them. The Bible says, the Lord is my light and my salvation whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? A verse that's not often read or used is found in Psalm 18, verse 28. For thou wilt light my candle. The Lord, my God, will enlighten my darkness. That's what Jesus Christ does for you and I when we receive Him. I came across that verse and there was a song, a verse and a chorus of a song that came to mind. One sat alone beside the highway begging. His eyes were blind, the light he could not see. He clutched his rags and shivered in the shadows. Then Jesus came and bade his darkness flee. When Jesus comes, the tempter's power is broken. When Jesus comes, 
the tears are wiped away. He takes the gloom and fills the life with glory for all when Jesus comes to stay. And that's what happens when you and I have trusted Jesus Christ. He bads the darkness flee and now the light is within you. Here's another chord. Remember when Jesus said, as long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Now he's gone, now that he's gone, he has given us commandment. We read this verse, ye are the light of the world. Jesus Christ tells his disciples that ye are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. You know, when you have a city that's sitting up on top, sometimes, uh, you know, when we're driving around and and uh, we're coming from, uh, let's say, Springville, and we come down the 219, there's a certain area that you come down off of that hill, especially at night, and you can see all of Buffalo, and you can see all the lights and everything. It, you can't hide it. It's there with all of those lights that are on in the various buildings, the street lights and everything. You can see that from a long distance away. That's what he's talking about. When you're out in the wilderness and it's dark out and they don't have any ambient light, you know, like uh, street lights and things along that line, but there is a town or a city up there, you can see the glow of that city. Cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick, and it giveth light unto all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Some other verses that need to go along with this, just to give you the understanding that when you receive Jesus Christ, you replace Him as the light of this world. In 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 9, But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Ephesians 5, 8, For ye were sometimes darkness. When you were lost, you were in darkness. But now are ye light. Walk as children of light. Philippians chapter 2, uh, do all things without murmurings and disputings, that ye may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God without rebuke in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation, among whom ye shine as lights in the world. Hold forth the word of light, that ye may rejoice in the day of Christ, that I, may, that I have not run in vain, neither labored in vain. We are here to shine as lights in the darkness of this world. This world is full of darkness. And sadly, there's very little light shining about this dark world. There are certainly more Christians out there that could let their light so shine but like Jesus said, they have taken their light and they put a bushel over it so that the light cannot be seen in this world. Ye are the light of the world. Not just a testimony for people to see how you live, but it is a voice to be used as well. It is a light. When you declare the gospel, you are bringing light into this world. When you witness to somebody, you are giving light to this world. When you preach on the street, you are giving light to this world. It's not just a matter of you living like you should, that you're commanded to, but it's also to be using your voice as a light in this world. Many others that have maybe put a bushel over their light to hide it completely. There are many others that are, have impediments that cast a shadow from their light. Now, let me give you an understanding. I alluded to it earlier. 
But if you have a light in the center of your room on the ceiling, anything that comes between the light and whatever the light is to shine upon, it casts a shadow. I don't know if you realized it, but a shadow is a is it the absence of light. Now there's light that comes around and still shines, but it casts a shadow. There is darkness associated with a shadow. Cast a shadow. And it hides the light from which it is intended to be seen. There are obstructions that are in our lives that cast shadows And do not allow the light to be seen as clearly. You can see it, the contrast of what I'm trying to talk about on a sunshiny day today with low humidity. Your vision is is clear. You can see great distances. There's no impediment to what you see. On a cloudy day, when the sun is behind the clouds, there is in essence a shadow that is cast upon the ground and around you and you don't see as far and you don't see as clearly. If you were to take that and go into a deep forest where there is heavy overgrowth of trees and you go deep into the forest, you realize that your vision is even cut even shorter. Even though the sun may be out, the dimness of that that, uh, overshadowing of trees keeps you from seeing things clearly. And as the sun begins to go down, that darkness, even though you may be able to see out, you know, in the street, but underneath the trees, you have difficulty seeing. There are obstacles that are in the way, and our sin is just as as an obstacle that comes and shine or cast a shadow upon the light that we're trying to shine. If you get the idea that, that you are the light of this world and you are casting a light to this world and you have sin in your life that is casting shadows, they are not seeing the light as it should be. They're seeing only the dimness of light from which comes around the impediment or the obstacle or the sin in your life. Let me try to maybe bring this a little bit closer to home. Someone, let's just take this as a hypothetical. Let's say, let's say I'll use myself as an example. Now when I trusted Jesus Christ, I realized that alcohol and so forth was, was wrong. I believe what the scripture said and I stopped going to the bar. And I stopped going to the bar. I didn't want people to associate that as a Christian, drinking was okay. But if I were to go into the bar, as I could could if I wanted to, and I sat at the bar and I ordered a Coke, and I sat at the bar and I didn't have any alcohol at all, what would people around me think? What would they think? that I had a Roman Coke instead of just a Coke. Now, they would be making a false assumption, but their assumption would be valid because that's the place that you have Roman Coke. I could try to talk about Jesus, as many Christians say that they do when they go to the bar, but they look at me and say, what, you're no different than I am. You see, the contrast, is opposites to each other. We're not trying to make them the same and have a shade of gray there so that we could be comfortable doing what we want to do instead of being the opposite of what God intends for us to be. He wants the world on this side and He wants us on this side. He doesn't want us walking hand in hand. So, my walking in this world is hiding the light of the glorious gospel of Christ because they're not connected. Light and darkness are not the same. Light repels darkness. 
Let me, let me see if I can give you a, a better idea of this. There are times in our solar system, the heavens declare the glory of God, the firmament showeth its handiwork, right? There are times when the world, the earth, gets in front of the sun and the moon. We call this a lunar eclipse. Do you realize that Jesus Christ is the sun? He's the type of the sun. Do you know what we are? We are a type of the moon. We do not have our own light. We only reflect the light that comes from the sun. So when the world gets in the way of the sun in relationship to the moon, you know what you can't see? You can't see the light of the moon. So when this world gets in the way of Jesus Christ, when the Christian puts the world in Christ, the light of the Christian cannot shine. It is darkened. We are lights, and we are supposed to shine forth as those lights. This world is to see and to hear of Jesus from us, to show forth His praises. And if we have that gospel message and we have sin in our lives, that gospel message is tainted. Living in the world will do just as much damage as sin, uh, uh, as sin will in preventing the light from shining into this world. Let me give you another chord. Let me just say that any light in a dark place is very noticeable. You can take the smallest of lights and put that in a dark room and everyone that is in that dark room will see it. And it can be a lightning rod, if you will, for those who want to attack the light. Let me give you an illustration, maybe help you understand. I read about this during the Korean War. It's probably taken place in other wars as well. But as the Americans were, were facing off against the North Koreans and the Chinese as they came over, so forth, during the, when they were on one side of the hill and the others were on the other side of the hill and they had their own trenches and foxholes and so forth, if, if one of the GIs lit up a cigarette, the light of that match or that light in the darkness would reveal his position and the enemy would shoot at him. They would shoot at the light. So what they used to do, they would take somebody and they would have this person would stand up and he would light a cigarette or turn on a, a, a lighter or something like that. And as soon as he did that, he would fall backwards into the arms of his comrades. Others on the line would, would look for the gunfire, the muzzle fire, and then they would fire upon that position. So they would use it as, as a ruse to get the enemy to reveal their position. I don't, real, I don't know if you realize, but if you become a light in this world, you're going to get shot at. Unfortunately, you're going to get shot at by your own side. Uh, my sons and I and others that we have gone with have faced the ridicule of those that say they're Christians and want to live in a worldly fashion and they're telling us that we're doing it all wrong when we're preaching on the street, that you're not going to win them that way. Look, we may get somebody to, to come to Christ on the street, but that's not what our total goal is. I mean, obviously, we would love to see people get saved there, but we're lighting a light in a dark place, letting them know where the answer is. The answer's in Jesus Christ. They may not think about it now. They may rest, you know, uh, ruminate on that for months and months. And finally, the Lord, at one point or another, through the Holy Spirit, will say, "Give something that'll trigger their heart, their mind. Maybe bring some trouble in their life." And the one thing they'll read about, or hear about, or Jesus saves, or you're going to hell, or something along that line that will create an urgency for them to receive Jesus Christ as their Savior. 
We're sending a warning. This, this modern Christianity has this idea that if it doesn't produce fruit now, it is not any good. That's not true. We are to be a light in a dark place. We talked about the last days and perilous times. I want you to know that whether we're talking about the world or we're talking about the church, we are in dark times. And anyone who gives light is going to be a target. And I'm not saying this to discourage you. I'm saying this to encourage you that even though this world and even though Christianity may take shots at you, you are doing the right thing by being a light in this world. Let me give you this verse, these verses. Take your Bible and turn to 1 Thessalonians. You follow along with me. Read this passage and we'll be done. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Beginning in verse 1. But of the times and the seasons, brethren, ye have no need that I write unto you. And we talked about those times for over 13, 14 weeks. In 2 Timothy chapter 3. Verse 2, For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. The rapture is going to take place without people knowing. It's like a thief taking out his, his prized possession. For when they say, shall say, Peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. But ye, brethren, are not in darkness, that that day should overtake you as a thief. Ye are all the children of light and the children of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. There as do others, but let us watch and be sober. For they that sleep, sleep in the night, and they that are drunken are drunken in the night. But let us of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and for an helmet, the hope of salvation. For God hath not appointed us to wrath, but, obtain, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with Him. Wherefore, comfort yourselves together. And edify one another, even as ye also do. And we beseech you, brethren, to know them which labor among you, and are over you in the Lord, and admonish you, and, esteem, uh, and to esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake, that be at peace among yourselves. Let me just say this. Be the light of you are intended to be. That's the admonition. Be the light you are intended to be. That you might fulfill the promise of God or the, or the commandment of God and bring a smile to His face and that you might be able to have some rewards in heaven for sticking it out, not hiding your light under a bushel, but letting it shine. So everyone can see it. So everyone knows who and what you are. That, you're not ashamed, that you are unashamed of Jesus Christ and the gospel. A stand. Be the light you are meant to be. Every head bowed, every eye closed. I hope the Lord has dealt with your heart as he's dealt with mine. You know, we get into funks and lulls in the world and the devil lulls us to sleep and gets us complacent with things. We need to be wakened every once in a while. Wakened to the truth. Awakened to righteousness. We need to be lights in this world. Because without us, this world has no hope. This world has no hope. We have the message that light is coming to this world and men 
Love darkness, unfortunately, rather than light. Father, thank you for the time that we have, Lord, this morning and the message that you've laid upon my heart. God, I pray that you would please use it for your glory. Pray, God, that you would minister to the hearts of people here and those that may catch this message later on on YouTube. God, I pray that you'd minister to them and deal with them. Help them to uh, decide within themselves that they are going to be the lights that you intended them to be. God, may they promise you, may they dedicate themselves to do just that and not be swayed by what this world may throw at them, but be encouraged that they're doing right in spite of what others may think. We ask this in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Amen. Lord bless.